going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Van Chats. I'm sitting here with John Hornbeck. John Hornbeck is a professional motocross rider, uh, professional cyclist, uh, now runs his own brand and is working with Monster Energy. I mean, the, just go down the list, man. The guy's kind of done it all. So, um, but yeah, John, how you doing, dude? Good, man. Just, uh, it's what day, Tuesday, you know? Yeah, I think it's office. Tuesday. I think that's what Tuesday, makes it cool yeah. about working from home. You just kind of forget what day <laughs> yeah. it is. You kind of figure it out, and uh, yeah, it's good. Uh, birthday's on Friday, so that's kind of something to look forward to. But um, yeah, just just another standard work week, and just trying to get it all done. Right on. Well, happy early birthday. Um, but Thank yeah, you. dude, let's kind of dive into a bit of you. I think if somebody looked up your social media right about now, they would know that you're this crazy brand geek, uh, probably from Monster, doing all these cool things, cool graphics, and kind of all these other cool things with Monster. But I kind of want to know that John pre that uh like you were a professional cyclist you've raced races such as tour utah did you race california too yeah did california my last year tour california um, so like yep. you've done some of the biggest races in the u.s and maybe even europe let's kind of dive into that where did that all come from where did that all start yeah it's definitely uh somewhat different i'd say from like i guess maybe most of your former pro or current pro cyclists that you have on here um you know i grew up you know, my dad was a motocross, mainly desert racer. So I grew up, you know, on a dirt bike at the age of two and a half, three. And that was my life. And obviously my goal and dream is just to be a professional supercross racer and just go down that path. So, you know, we, we did that from a very early young age. Um, got very serious when I was about 10. Started traveling the country, doing all the big nationals. Um, you know, eighth grade was the last time I went to school. I was homeschooled from there on out just because we wow. were missing so much school to race. Yeah. Um, had my fair share of injuries throughout that sport. Um, yeah, so that was, that was that. Now it was getting close to like, you know, getting better. And then, um, 2008, it kind of just all came to a halt. Um, that was like right when I was getting my pro license to get into supercross and, you know, motocross is very different from um, cycling as far as like, you know, I wasn't any like top, top, you know, hot prospect, but I feel like I was kind of like the next line under. And, uh, you know, so we had support, but still we were, we were spending a lot of money on it. Um, fortunately, my dad had his own business and, you know, he did well, but I mean, even still with that and the support, we we're, you know, spending like a hundred grand a year on racing. I was about to say, and yeah, like <laughs> pause for a quick second, because I, I have an idea of motocross. And this yeah. is the reason why I called you a professional from the get go. So hopefully you don't, you, you're not offended. Cause I know some cyclists are like, whoa, whoa I'm not professional. Um, yeah. But the reason why I say that is because just break down what a weekend training would look like in gas and in tires alone. Well, yeah, it was just crazy. Like, I mean, like, so yeah, I won't, I won't say like I was fully professional. You know, I was like amateur yeah, pro yeah. is how I do the racing, but I didn't have my, you know, I couldn't go to supercross yet. I didn't have my pro license, which is what we were doing. But like, yeah, I mean, I had a, you know, we ha I had a mechanic, you know, I had a physical trainer, I had a riding Insane. coach, um, you know, obviously you go to the track three, four days a week, so you're paying, you know, track fees, you're paying gas, like, you know, I had five bikes, I had a practice bike, a local race bike, a, you know, national stock bike, a national mod bike, and we had a backup bike, you know, and Jesus. we had a motorhome, we had a trailer, like, it was insane. That sounds pretty amateur, yeah. Yeah, sounds <laughs> yeah pretty amateur. Like, it's, it was so funny when I got into cycling and people would be like, Oh my goodness. Like I have to have like another pair of wheels. I'm like, you guys don't know how much money actually goes into <laughs> some sports. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, it was a lot like hands down, but my dad was, you know, he was the best. He was committed a hundred percent. And, you know, he told me, he's like, Hey, if you want to do this, we'll go all the way. You know, if you, you start messing around or, you know, being, being dumb, like it's done. So <clears throat> I was really focused from a young age on doing that. Even with the injuries I had, um, you know, I almost passed away when I was 14, you know, I've had two Jeez. life flights, I've broken like 20 plus bones, six concussions. So like, it's just, I, I, I think, cause I'm naturally a smaller, smaller person. I think that's what really helped me in cycling. Like when I hit the ground, I usually got hurt, <laughs> which was yeah. a bummer, but it is what it is. So yeah. So 2008 happened and just, it was just a lot of things, like I said, came to a halt with the economy going down, you know, or unfortunately my dad's business went under and it was just like one day it was like, we we're done. We you literally we cannot do this anymore. So um yeah, that was like two thousand eight when I was like eighteen. So at the time I lived inland empire area. I'm from LA 
and that's where I grew up and that's where my dad's business was. And then we made the move out to Temecula area when I was probably 15 because that's it's more the hub for all that for the moto stuff. So obviously like, I, I had my life out there too, like my friends. And then basically when that happened, my dad was like, hey, like I'm going back to LA to figure out my business stuff. And I'm like, well, I don't want to go there. Like I'll figure it out out here. So, you know, I was, I was graduated already like off home school. I had like nothing going on. Um, to backtrack a little bit, like the last year I was um, training, I got onto a road bike because, you know, we were starting to do some more base miles. I, I never ridden a road bike, but it was like, hey, like, you know, this is going to be better for your cardio and recovery. So, I mean, I was riding a road bike maybe like two or three times a week and it was like an hour spin. Like, so, like, I look back, I had no idea what we were doing, but sure. it was what it was. <laughs> and so, uh, but I actually surprisingly took to it as far as like I enjoyed it. And I was always the guy that was like, oh, I don't need to ride a road bike i just thought it was really not cool and like lame like i was like that motor yeah, dude the spandex so then I, yeah i was like it's just that's dumb like, i wish i had photos of when i first started road, like road bike i'd be like in a sweatshirt and stuff just like, For sure. like oh, yeah, i'm cool and like look like a which is the cool probably. thing to do now like yeah when you think a, oh yeah now yeah. i'm like wearing a t-shirt and a tank top and all that I'm, like a windbreaker i'm like all right you know it's come yeah. full circle but so yeah that was um so i would actually because i didn't have a road bike i would use my uh, my trainer's wife's bike so like, that's oh, like how I was not into it. So like after that year, I kind of like, I got a job, like some minimum wage, cool boy job, just doing nothing and just had no idea what to do with my life. And is, you know, probably not making the best decisions, but I would still come around and hang out with my coach and go for rides with him. And he was like, you should really like try cycling. Like, I think this and that. And I'm like, no, like I just, I, I'm on, you know, at that point I was like 19. I'm like, I'm not going to start another sport from scratch like I just spent like 14 years trying to make this happen and it did not work like so that was like so depressing I'm like I don't want to go through this again so that went off like a year where I would just kind of ride with him every now and then and then after about that I was like kind of get more into it and I'm like okay maybe I'll get a bike and try this out because I'm not doing anything with my life right now so I bought some cheap, did you go to college you know, or anything like that or did you do no I never went to college or nothing because I mean at the time like smart decision dude you know, I'm like 40 yeah. Grand yeah so yeah and that's the thing like my <laughs> yeah. my dad's business went under so we didn't have money yeah i had no money i was living on couches and working minimum wage and it's just like and even at the time i'm like well what would i even go to college for like i don't even know what i'm gonna do so for sure why spend all the money doing it and um so yeah i was kind of floating around so i got on a bike and uh so it just kind of like, you know, I met like a local bike shop out in that area and they kind of helped me with like, Hey, maybe you should look into like hanging out with this person or that. Like, Cause I had no idea what I was doing. So I just started, started riding more on group rides and uh, kind of like getting advice from people. And then that was at like, I think I was going into 2010. Okay. And um, so I did my first race out here, which was like Boulevard. And I was going into it thinking like, oh, like everyone says I'm super good and I'm natural. Like, so I'm thinking like beginner status for like moto, which is like, you know, really like easy. Like those guys just got on bikes. I didn't realize like a cat five is like, could be a dude riding for five years. <laughs> they just oh, come yeah. in and do well. Or like a mountain biker is like, oh, I got to go into a fives. So I got smoked, got dropped, you know, and I was just like, all right, well, this is not what I had envisioned. <laughs> So, yeah, because you, I mean, you have you have your closet guys who who will never upgrade. Yeah, like that's they can they literally just show results. up and smash yeah. it, and I'm like, yeah, okay, this is not went to plan. So, uh, so then I was pretty much over it after that. And then this one guy who was like kind of like the local coach dude in that area, he was like, no, no, like give it another shot. Come to like Valley of the Sun like in two weeks. Wow, some so of these races like, okay, that you're doing like, are pretty like pretty big races, like. Yeah, and I was like, okay, like, I have, no, like, he's like, it'll be better, it's gonna be, like, warmer, and I, he's just like, I'm like, all right, he's like, give it one more try, so, go out there, and it's my second race, and the TT's on Friday, which, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing, I was a little scrawny climber kid on an aluminum bike, I got dead last in the TT, so that basically, like, just padded it for me, like, I'm That's your weekend done. up. You're yeah, I'm like, roll. I'm You're done with this, roll. dude, like, yeah. this is the stupidest sport ever. <laughs> And uh, I was staying out with a buddy and I was like, let's just go out. And I think it was like some house part. Like, it was just, I was just like, let's just go have fun, dude. Like I'm, I'm yeah. over, I'm not going to race anymore. And then, so we went had fun. And then he's like, dude, you should do the race tomorrow. So I'm like, you know, cat five is like 7 a.m. I'm like, no, no. He's like, no, let's do it. So we literally like drove out like, I don't know, like 1 a.m. in his truck to like the, 
you know, it's so far in the desert out there. And we just slept in his truck, woke up at seven, did the race. I think it was like one or it was two laps probably. And I remember I just kind of like, we went into the final climb on like two laps. And I just kind of like rode off the side of people and no one kind of did anything. And so I ended up winning that race. And uh, so you go from like getting cable. dropped dead last <laughs> yeah. and then trying to quit, then getting smashed and then winning a race. Yeah. So that was like the second, and I was like, okay. And that kind of like turned it for me. I'm like, all yeah. right, this, that was cool. And uh, <laughs> so then of course we went out and celebrated again. And the crit was like, again, 7am and I missed the crit because we were up too late. So uh, like, if you look at my results, it's like dead last first and then like DNS at Valley of the Sun. For oh like man, five. it's brutal. So, uh, but yeah, I got into it after that. And, um, I was just like, started going to more races and, you know, I got bumped out of the fives and like, three more races because I won the next couple again and then you know everyone was like oh you know making a cat one in one season is pretty hard like I don't know too many people do it I'm like all right that's a cool like challenge and like a goal like so cycling finally kind of pulled me out of like this weird spot I was in of like something to focus on yeah so I was like all right let me try to get to a one at the end of the year and so like that year I just like I was still working that job during the week like that pool clean job so I basically like go work from like five in the morning to one come home and just train and on the weekends, I was, like, had a little Honda Civic, and I would, because basically, you know, like, SoCal was all, like, crits and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I needed to go to the, the races that I could get points. So, I was always going to either Nevada, Arizona, or NorCal. So, I just, like, jump in my Honda Civic, drive to the race, sleep in the car, do the race, and then come home. And fortunately, doing all that, I was able to get my one upgrade at the end of the year. I think I did, like, 48 races that year. Wow. So, that was cool. So, I was like, all right, cool. Like, maybe, you know, and, you know, locally, like, started getting a little more support and then uh you know so like to kind of backtrack that was actually the first year that I started like the event stuff pre-spandex yeah. like I started my Halloween parties which is like so left center but like that was like the beginning of my event knowledge yeah. and it, it was just funny how like they they coincided like my first year racing was the first year I did my first event and the event just like real quick was just like my my birthday is the day before Halloween um which is coming up this friday and so like that year you know i was even like couch surfing and stuff i was with some buddies and you know like my, my moto buddies so obviously like they're whatever and they like have fun and they're like dude we should do like a like there's like nothing going on for halloween that year so they're like we should do like a big halloween party for you and i'm like no like I, i'm just not that guy that's like from the john hornbeck's birthday like that's just i'm not front and center yeah. like that <clears throat> so my last name being Hornbeck, everyone's called me, my dad, like the whole, my whole life, like horny. Like that's just always been branded with that <laughs> since I was like yeah. a little kid. So they're like, either you're getting like, bullied or you have your friends calling you horny. And <laughs> yeah. You and I was know. like, all right, all right. You know, I'm not going to argue. Like just my dad's called it. I'm like, it's, it is, it is what it is. So, uh, yeah. so they're like, call it Halloween horny fest. So I'm like, okay, like that's kind of cool. That's kind of funny. Yeah. So we were like, let's just do this house party. Like, we brought a DJ in. We like cleared out the whole house. Like we put like painters tape down on the ground. This like is all pre the VIP people. room. Yeah, people this is 2010. Yeah, so this is a while could ago. Be in the same room. <laughs> yeah, so I know glory days. Yeah, yeah. But um, so yeah, it was a cool house party, and then um, you know, no issues, success. It's super fun. So going into year two, like I was just a cat one. Um, just rode for like a domestic elite team. Uh, I think I did like cascade that year and i didn't do anything special did okay and then i think i i think i got a couple results at like i did decent like san Dimas for like just kind of being on my own or like state championships i think i was like top five or something like so i had a couple like local results so there were a few friends i was able to get on the hog and vermin team out of seattle which was like you know it, that was before it was u23 so it was like an elite yeah. team and I remember there's all this drama because that was actually when uh, I was riding for Swamis back when I kind of had an elite team out here, like the second part of my second year. So they promised me all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, like stay with us and we'll, uh, you know, we're going to do all these races next year. But I know it was kind of like an unproven like thing. And basically in my, and back in my head, I was like, I have like a very small span <laughs> on how, if I can make it to pro. So I have to like be real smart with the decisions I make and you know, who I go with. So, cause I mean, at the time I was like 22, which is, you know, I missed all the U23 stuff. 
Yeah, and you just so, have to hope that a lot of these teams yeah, are like, like saying and, the truth when they're like, because I mean, it could go both ways, right? Like you go oh, to exactly. Hoggins Berm and I mean, they folded. Like it could have yeah. been that same time. You never know how that stuff's going to play out. <laughs> but fortunately, Hoggins had kind of at that time had a proven track record with like, hey, we do like the sure. NRC calendar. We go to all these races. Yeah, listen, I'm like, okay. And even though it was like in Seattle, like mainly Northwest guys, I think there were some guys from Idaho, like I would have been the only California kid. So I ended up choosing to go with them. I remember all the Swans guys were pissed. Like that, yeah. I don't know. I don't think the guys were there anymore. But like there was all this drama and stuff, and they're like talk like putting blowing me out. On, so it was just I'm like, dude, this is, I'm like, glad I did not go. Well, there's some California. There's always some California drama somewhere. Oh yeah, right? dude. Like, I mean, dude, I live in Orange County, dude. There's plenty of drama out here. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, a, there's enough drama <laughs> in California bikes. for for just yeah, the bike scene I'm, in general. I'm used to. It. I came from the moto industry, so um, I just thought that was hilarious. But uh. So it was a good, good move. You know, it was a proven, I remember like I tripped out too. Cause like, obviously I was like an elite rider, like cat one, I wasn't pro. And they're like, all right, so here's your bikes. You know, here's all your clothing. We're going to fly you to all the races. We got your house. Nice. And I'm just like, wait, what? Like back when I was racing moto, we were paying how much for all this? And like, you guys are just going to do it for free. And cause they're like, we can't pay. I'm like, Dude, like, I'm so like, I'll figure it out. Like as far as money, like I'll pick up a second job or do this and that so yeah because there's not a single cycling team nowadays doing that no it's like i just it was like the perfect little timing of that so yeah i was over the moon those guys were super cool director was cool like i mean we had a mechanic i was like dude this is insane so that was like my third year racing i'm like wow this is like really cool so then coincide like that was the second year i did the halloween party and i wasn't planning on doing it because i live in an apartment with a buddy at this point everyone's like dude you can do like horny fest again it was like the week before it was like myspace days still and i'm like no oh, no yeah. like i'm like i can't i don't even have like a house anymore i live in an apartment and so my one but buddy but you could have invited your whole top eight to your apartment <laughs> yeah right you exactly totally i'm like dude the eight are here <laughs> so but uh so yeah so my buddy like a week before was like hey you can do it at my house he lived in like temecula wine country and he had a huge backdoor spread that like they used for hosting weddings so it was perfect he's like hey we just keep it outside parents said they're cool i'm like all right like why not let's try it out put it out like a week before and it was epic we did the whole backyard is all done up djs again and i think we had like around 500 people there it just wow. blew up yeah and it was just the perfect time and once again nothing happened so then we go into like year three you know hoggins was pretty good like i was always like one of the you know i never dnf to race i was kind of always like getting closer like one of the best amateur riders at the events but like never top 10 stuff but like kind of made a good leap forward yeah. so then i signed with hoggins again for the next year and uh and it went really well like i was starting to get like best amateur jersey and stuff you know i was usually like the first amateur on the climbing stage at like gila or cascade um so like another good progression and, and now you know going back that was kind of like with cycling i'm like so I wasn't super into it like it was cool because it was something I was finally good at I mean not saying I wasn't I wasn't bad at moto but like I felt like I was a lot better at cycling than I was moto so it was like almost like my second shot at becoming a professional so that's kind of what kept me into it and uh but I always told me from day one I'm like hey like the year goes backwards for me like I'm out because I'm getting older I don't want to be in that position with motocross where I was stuck with nothing at the end of the day like i'm getting older i need to have a career of some sort of a business or or something that's that's what i was about to say i mean i feel like with a lot of the fact that you even made it that far in cycling or even gave it cycling that much of a chance like three years that's a long time dude like yeah and if i have an idea of what you went through i mean california is a little bit more plentiful when it comes to teams and support but the support isn't the same as you think and i know you dealt with with motocross so like even an amateur with support at that level you're still spending thousands upon thousands upon yeah. thousands of dollars but it's hard to be really good at something and then have to start all over just start from ground yeah. ground zero so like the fact that, that you're even there yeah and that's where it's just like good timing being around good people but like yeah i mean there was a good year and a half or so like not weird middle ground it was really depressing and like not a good state but yeah. uh so yeah, I mean, I give cycling a lot of credit. Like it really pulled me out, but um, yeah. So I mean, it, I was like, all right, as long as I'm progressing every year and getting on a better team or getting better results or like starting to make money, like, but the year it goes south, I'm out. And so 
and then obviously I could work on my event, even though it was like my one event a year, but like that was kind of something to be excited about because I really fell in love with like event promotion. So, you know, the last year at Hoggins, so I was like year four, did well, you know, and then I started talking to pro teams. And uh, that was like the first year I took the Halloween event to a venue. And I was like, okay, like, let's see if this actually has legs to it. So I was like, all right, we're going to rent a venue and see if we can turn this into a real thing. So then I was like, all right, how are we going to go from free like house party to you have to come pay? So I was like, all right, I got a venue pretty cheap. It was pretty nice. And I was like, all right, well, girls come in free, guys will pay. So the girls are going to be there, the guys will come. So it was like, girls are free, guys are 10 bucks. And we had like 750 people that night. So now I started making some money on it. Yeah. I was like, okay, this has got legs. So were you selling drinks so, and alcohol at that point? Yeah, it was full, like bar service, everything. So it was, it was 21 plus, you know. And I think just so you guys, legit. just so you guys know, like he he runs this uh, this brand or this company called uh, Spandex Stampede, which I'm, I'm assuming he's gonna about to get into what it is. But I just want to let you know why he's doing these events and how this. Is yeah, that this him. is where I learned my event. This is like my event schooling. Okay. So, so your event schooling while trying to be professional. So you, you yeah, know, party and trying great. to be professional. <laughs> All right. Well, and that's a fun, that's a funny thing. Cause like everyone thought like I was partying hard, like my friends in Temecula, but it was like, it would just worked out well because it was a Halloween party. So it was my off season and yeah. I wasn't like a party guy cause I was training and stuff. So it was like once out of a year, I'd come out and like have this huge event, but like I was on planning it, promoting it. Like I wasn't out partying and stuff. It was just like the name kind of got recognition yeah yeah just built like kind of like a i guess you could say almost a brand before like brand was so trendy to say yeah so like people thought i was like some kind of party carriers now but it's like they didn't realize i was like cycling you know nine months out of the year you know For in sure. the season and then like in the off season i planned this halloween party so it's just it's it was like really funny how the timing worked on that so you know the next year it got bigger you know went to like a thousand people and like now i'm actually making money on it from like the door to i get percentage of the bar um, and then I even had like Benny starting to like pay for me to come to post the event there. Cause it was like the biggest Halloween party in town. So that worked was working well. And so then I signed with, uh, so I signed with five hour energy with Frankie. He was the first guy to give me a go. So that was 2014. Basically, you know, I'm calling all the teams and putting myself out there and like, Hey, I'll, you know, what do I have to do? And then I remember, Someone was like, oh, well, you don't really have any experience in Europe or this and that. So then I had a friend that had a, he was Such a great guy. Such yeah. A great I was quote. like, I was like, well, dude, sorry. Like I came into it late. So yeah. I had a friend that, um, okay. So this was actually the year before. So this is the last year of Poggins. I was starting to get that answer. Like when I was trying to get on a pro team and I almost got on a pro team 2013. It would have been like the, the Ken big gear grinder team. Yeah. Like I was really close and it didn't work out, but I kept getting like, you have no European experience. You've never done national team. So I had a friend that had a place in France and I went over with him for the first three months of the season in January. And I lived in France and I got like a French elite license and I just lived over there by myself with him in a house. And I just did all the world, like the French cups just on my yeah. own, like under is like a, so like, here's my, you know, so I was doing all the, the you know, three day amateur elite races and, you know, this and that, it's getting decent results. But I was like, all right, here you go. Like, here's my European experience. I went over and did it on my own. Came back and raced Hoggins, did pretty well. And then um, Frankie gave me a call in the off season. It was like, Hey, like we can sign you, but like, it's for zero dollars. And I'm like, well, cool. Like sign me up. I don't give a shit. Like I have, yeah. like, I'm, I'm figuring out my money on my end. It's like, what am I going to say? No, like go back yeah. to the amateur team for free. Like for sure. Sign me up. So, so that was like my first, uh, like run, you know, my first pro team. And I remember I, we had like a pretty stacked team that year too. It was like, it was Gavin Mannion. Cause he just came off bond for like four years. So he was like our DC guy. And then we had like Jake Kehoe, Jake Kehoe, who was like our sprinter guy. Um, he came from UHC. So it was like a, pretty legit team for like my first year and I didn't even race like the first half of the year like I didn't even do Redlands or San Dimas and like I lived 30 minutes away so that was kind of depressing but I was like I get it you know first guy so I think the first I, forget what, I think I did Gila and I did decent at Gila and I was like around 10th was Phil and Guyman on was, the team at the time as well no Guyman left 
because that was when they like kind of merged like it was kind of like kenda gear grinder with five hour energy and oh, like, okay, okay, okay. so i missed phil okay so i think phil went to optum or Bissell something or Bissell. like Garmin. i don't think yeah. that was before Garmin, but yeah we just miss each other but um so i went to that team and i started like kind of being the better guy on the team which i don't think anyone expected and then i remember we went to um and this is kind of what opened the door for him cappy because i was talking to craven like one or two years before that like really trying cool to get guy. on that team cool guy yeah and uh, it just never panned out so i mean at that time like him cappy was like the team to yeah. be on like yeah. they were just crushing it. i think that was like robin won a stage of colorado and you know they're they're just like the badass team and they just pulled out the results everywhere so i was trying to get on that but obviously like it didn't work so then i went to five hour and then we went to um boast and this was kind of like the the race for me like that kind of stuck out like the first stage is kind of like a hard hilly stage and i got on the break and it was like me and like two of the handicap guys i know it was joey roscoff was in it and like schmaltz i think and we had a couple other guys and so basically i got the kom jersey on the first day out of and then we almost went to the line we had like a i remember we had like a seven minute break like it was we should have gone to the line but then you know typical like i think I think Joey was kind of the one that messed up because obviously Joey was like really good at the moment. I mean, I mean, he still was good. Like, but at that time, like he was like kind of the guy coming up and I don't think, I think it was like some like no one, like the other teams didn't want to work with him or let him go. Cause it was like, he's just going to win this whole thing. So we literally were just like looking at each other. It just sucked. So we got caught like one kid ago. Yeah. We should have gone to the line of like two minutes. So whatever. I got the KOM Jersey that day. And uh, so that was cool. I was like my friend, I was like my first UCI, like whatever. 2.1 or something mm-hmm. and then the second day was like the mountaintop finish and it was like raining and cold and i missed the break so that was depressing because my other guy i think i was battling josh berry and he was on like um smart stop yeah so i beat him the day before to get the KOM. he made it into the break and i missed it and i was just like you know that was my only job so i was like okay i'll just you know help oh i had a it was, so it was, it was gavin and we had a uh, Chad Byer and okay. Byer came from like BMC. So yeah. I had those, so it was like John helped these two guys up the climb because you were in the break all day before you missed your KOM Jersey. Like you just now work for us. Like, all right, cool. So they ended up not having the best day and I felt really good. And I ended up like sixth or seventh on the climb. And I was like, you know, maybe like 30 seconds off the wind. So like if we would have had like any time going in the first day, that would have gone into actually yellow that day. So that was when Craven started talking to me again. Cause it was like this kid was in the break all day and then he like top 10 it and now he's on GC. And then I ended up, I think like 12th or 13th overall that week. So that wow. opened the door for that, for me getting on him cappy. I did some other races. I went to China and did like Qinghai Lake. And so I got some good like experience outside of the, the uh, you know, the States on that. So, and then I did another party, you know, it got bigger again. I think we were up to like 1500 people at this time. So like that was actually funding a lot of my, racing wow. it was like making the money at the door and like the bar so like i was kind of like learning more and more about the events and then so then i finally got a deal with hank happy going into 15 and i finally was getting paid i think it was like fifteen thousand salary and then i i had a deal with someone else I think like a shoe brand or something i forget which one but like they gave me like a few grand too so i was like okay i'm making a little bit of money now to basically pay rent and just focus on racing Sure. I was stoked. I was like, I'm going to quit my job. Like I'm going to live, you know, whatever, just pay for my rent and just focus on being a cyclist. Cause at the time I was still working. Well, it went South because long story short, I tried to do this whole other event and I got way too ahead of myself. And basically like the parties before were like not much overhead cost because venues were starting to pay me to come there i basically had to pay for like djs and photographers and some lighting it was, it was real minimal so it's like not much of a risk i saw this really cool party in europe and it had like <laughs> this pump track thing yeah. and it was like this pump track contest with all these athletes from different like you know sports and then they had a party after i'm like dude i can do that like i know all these athletes in like moto and snow and bmx and you know, I'm in Temecula and like, I have this party that's huge. So I rented out like this go-kart track, pole position, indoor thing. And this is where I really learned my events stuff. Like, you know, I had to get like 
you know, a business license for liability. Like I had to rent a pump track. I had to get an ABC license to have alcohol because this place didn't serve alcohol, do all the promotion. And I basically spent 15 grand on this event off of four credit cards. Just like, Oh, it's going to work for sure. And it didn't. Oh, <laughs> it was just shit. like, it's a long, like I changed too many things. It was just confusing. So basically well, I'm going just thinking year, of the liability insurance alone. When you said go-kart track, I was <laughs> like, oh shit, somebody broke yeah. something. Oh yeah. And luckily <laughs> someone did, I mean, not luckily, someone did get hurt, but like they were very yeah. cool and like nothing happened. And, uh, but it was just like that, like such a brutal feeling because like I finally made it like, oh, I'm finally like a paid pro cyclist, even though it was like for nothing. But it was like, I just lost my whole salary in one night. Jeez. So I'm like, back to work yeah and uh so the first year with handicap was pretty good um you know i had some decent results nothing super outstanding but like you know another step up and uh i think it came together at like tour of alberta last year that was like right when um right when we had worlds over here so and they had the ttt so i remember like I think Katusha, I think like whatever Mitchell and Scott was back then, they like brought their TTT teams to Alberta to like train. And I, I, I know like Yates was there and there was like some heavy, heavy hitters. So I didn't do California that year. I did Utah. I did decent. I was like around like 20th or something like that. And uh, then I did Alberta and I think I was like 10th or 11th overall at Alberta. Wow. Yeah. That's and I was like one of the first continental guys. So that was cool. And then, so right away I got re-signed for another year. I think they doubled my salary that next year. And then I basically went back to my old Halloween party, had another big 1500 person one. Cause I just was like, screw that pump track thing. I'm not losing money like that. Yeah. Made good money on that. And the next weekend I did my first cycling event, Spanish Stampede in Temecula because Temecula always had a Fondo. So I didn't want to like do it while they do it, but then they folded or just stopped doing it. So I was like, well, it's good timing. Just do it now. So I really like just got kind of like thought smart with it of like, I got a cool venue in the wineries short ride is like 50 miles. So I wanted to like emphasis more on like the after part of the event, not like make it some really hard thing. Yeah. So like permitting was pretty cheap and I was like, okay, let's, let's test this. I'll do like 200 riders. I could probably sell that out. And then I just looked at it from like a cost perspective of like, all right, if I sell 200 riders, like I know I'd have to have 200 plates of food, 200 shirts, 200 numbers, 200 things of insurance. And basically I just took my number, which was like, I think it was like entry fee was like $60. It was just like cheap. I just want to like, kind of like see if I can pull this off. But I just like backtrack it. Like it was like $60 minus like $9 for food minus this for that, that, you know, my profit margin is like $36 per head. So like I could pre-sell this, like I'll already go be in the green going into it. And that's how I did it. So I did a Halloween party one weekend and the next weekend was my cycling event that we sold out like 200 riders. And wow. so like back to back weekends, like it was two different events, but like the cycling event was cool, a success. And like everyone liked it. And I really enjoyed that. That was like a real event, you know, I'm not really just like a party promoter at that point. So then, yeah, I went into the year 2017 racing for Happy, the decent, uh, we had McCabe on that year, so we did really well at, like, Redlands, and we just had yeah, another yeah. great team of just everyone doing well, and went to California, I got put on that team, and um, did well, I was, like, 13th or 14th on Gibraltar, um, so then I was, like, top 15 on GC for the whole week, and then the last, kind of stuck, I think I was 15th in the last day, and I got stuck down a crash on, like, the flat stage, and I dropped like a couple spots. I think I was like 17th. So top 20, my first California, which was cool. And then um, I was top 10 at nationals that year. And then, uh, yeah, that was like the year I was, you know, no, no, no. So it was the year before I was like at the end. And that was like, I think pro Nats were in Tennessee. They had like a hard climbing stage. They'd do the hard climbing stage and go downtown. Yeah. And, and only like, yeah, yeah. yeah, so only nine of us made it over the climb at the end. And uh, it was like, I think it was like, that was your Boucher one. So we were like nine of us going into like the last 10K. And I remember George came up to me and he was like, no one knows who you are. Like, just sit on, like, do well. And like, it was raining. I was like all excited. I'm like, cool, I got this. 
I remember coming down like a hill and it was like, I think it was like Dombrowski, Talansky, and Howes. And I was kind of sitting on, and I remember Dombrowski came through this corner and he kind of like, it was water, it was wet, so he didn't take it that well. And he opened up a huge gap. So he just kind of looked at me and I'm like, oh, because like he had his two teammates up front, so he's not going to close it. So I sprinted yeah. around him, went into the final, went into the corner, the next corner way too fast, ate shit. Literally oh. five minutes after George is like, dude, no one knows who you are. Just like, you like, you got this. Everybody so, knows who you are now. <laughs> yeah. So I limped <laughs> in for like, I think I got ninth. I just oh, rode by man. myself for the last. So that was a bummer, but like, that was cool. Yeah. So then I, next year I did well at Cali. Um, I did okay. I don't think I did that well on nationals because I was like the week after, but then the next week was Winston-Salem and I had a good result there. Utah, actually DNF because like I kind of a crash and I got stung by a bee and I'm allergic and just broke that whole thing off. Jeez. But like at that time, I had kind of like a deal to go over to Europe with a pro Connie team. I was kind of like ready to go to that. So I was like, all right, cool. Like now we're going to Europe. That's the next step. And uh, that was the year that like uh, EOM, I think, sat, or Kinkoff folded. So it just mm. flooded the market. And, you know, like October, they're like, yeah, we're good. Like we're going to sign all these other guys now. And I lost that. And Cappy filled up. And I could have gone for like another continental team, made way less money. And I was about turned 27. I'm like, you know what? We're done. <laughs> like this is the year I went backwards. It up. Yeah. And that was how cycling ended for me. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, but, but, but you made a pretty solid transition because you guys had a team sponsor at the time was Mon monster hydro and no, yeah. That was before that. Oh yeah. So that was way before. Yeah. So actually like, so it was about two years before that happened. Um, I was working freelance for road bike action that year because okay. I knew Neil Shirley really well. And I was always just like putting myself out there. Like I had like a blog and I was just trying to like build myself up more and get more of a following and just, Hey, can I write for you? I'd go to like websites and just, like, you want a race recap and just trying to like, you know, basically just mingle meet people. So I started writing for the magazine that year, like, which was really awesome. I did like two or three like magazines, you know, stories. And then, basically when i stopped racing that was right when neil left the magazine so the magazine called me like hey like you've already kind of worked with us do you want to come work here full time now that you're done racing so i was like yeah sign me up so i went straight from racing to editorial for road bike action wow so it was like perfect timing and like just thankfully i put myself out there like that so i worked for them for two years and built my events on the side still and, uh, you know, for the magazine, I was doing editorial for them. I was still doing events for them. I would go to Europe for like bike launches and you know, I started their podcast for them. I was running all their social media for them and just kind of like, it was really cool. Cause they're kind of like, Hey, like, you know, it was, you know, there was like a small staff over there and they're kind of like, Hey, like do what you want to do, like help build whatever you want. Like, and I was like, yeah, I'm all for it. Like, let me do whatever I can. So it was a really great experience. Those guys are all super cool. I worked for under Zap, which is, you know, he's still a good friend of mine and really just gave me a good opportunity. It's like my first real job. And, uh, and I, I like writing actually. Like I enjoy editorial stuff. I was like, you know, I was always like the English honors kid in school and stuff and like, I just enjoyed it. So it was a good fit. For sure. So, um, yeah, I did that for two years and then, uh, you know, obviously I had my ties with Monster just from Moto, but like, you know, it's funny. I always thought like, it'd be so cool to see a claw and like a cycling helmet, but like, you know, it wasn't really like, you know, it wasn't really quite there. And then. Cause Red Bull um, was doing that at the time. They didn't have many cyclists. Yeah, they cyclists. were. Yeah, they had a couple, <laughs> but still like, it wasn't really like big. Like, I think I, I, I heard they tried to sponsor Finney at one point and they didn't yeah. accept it. And I was like, oh, that would have been cool. Like I could have opened the door. And then yeah. they had some like one-off riders, especially mountain biking. But um, yeah, you didn't really see much of energy stuff in, in cycling, especially road. So basically i met i became friends with um some of the monster guys and then greg who works on the muscle hydro brand and he would come to my events and just kind of i know him through like other moto guys and he's local and we we started became friends over maybe like my, my last year because you know i think they did advertisement as well with the magazine so it's kind of like yeah. we just kind of all started crossing over and then uh just an opportunity opportunity came up with um with a hydro brand with like the team growing and they wanted to get more into endurance. And then obviously like with my background with the magazine, I was doing all the digital and their website and their social. And that's kind of what they needed on the hydro brand. And they wanted to like influence and get into cycling. 
So it was a great, like they spoke to me about the opportunity and obviously I jumped all over it. And uh, after a bit of time, we were able to make that transition. And so I went over there to Monster and that was about almost two and a half years ago now. And that's, that's been an amazing experience, obviously like working, you know, at the end of the day in a marketing department for a, a massive company like that and, and huge company still be no, no yeah. college degree so you went from what is that yeah. horny fest is that what it's called <laughs> yeah horny <laughs> fest like you moto fest? cycling spandex it's fucking rad yeah it's yeah. it's funny how things plan out like that but um yeah you know i could not be more you know grateful to those guys you know for giving me an opportunity to come over there and i mean everyone there is so cool and i you know i've gotten to work with you know, moto athletes, musicians, you know, a lot of people that fall in like the athlete space and, you know, doing, you know, helping, you know, navigate their cycling, you know, venture and bringing on guys that I think could fit the brand well or bring on teams and doing events and then, you know, learning more in the digital space and, you know, social and marketing and back end, just like all the, I mean, it's, it's like you come like, so you, you learn so quickly and you're around a great group of people. So, that's that's been like a dream come true to like work for a company like that and just to grow with them so that's where i'm at now and um yeah they've been great even during this whole you know COVID thing like they've been one of like the best companies around so like they really look after their employees and and it, it's been great so like uh, obviously spandex is kind of like on hold right now for with sure, COVID. For sure. so i lost the uh, i lost all my events this year and we're gonna start doing personal camps um private camps the whole because I made this switch into the whole, whole gravel scene, yeah, um, yeah. specifically for Spandex because I just enjoy it way more. But, um, yeah, it's been a crazy like last and almost, yeah, 10 years now since I started cycling and you know, kind of where it's come come to now with you know, obviously working full time and still riding for fun. And so, do you ever cut that friend in who told you you should just throw a party 10 years ago and you were like, oh, I'm not really <laughs> he's, <feeling> still, <laughs> he's still a buddy. I unfortunately haven't talked to him much lately, but uh, like, I literally still. It's funny. I remember I, I don't have the best memory. Yeah. And I think that is due to a lot of head injuries, but <laughs> I remember yeah. sitting on the couch at my house in Menifee and we literally thought of that idea for Horny Fest and we made the flyer right there on the couch. I was like, dude, that's yeah. awesome. And I remember being in the parking lot at Sprouts going into the store and Frankie called me and he's like, Hey, like, do you want, like, we can give you a contract. And it's, so it's funny to like have these moments that like stand out. Yeah. And uh, just how it's kind of happened, because obviously I never had a plan. I was just like, all right, like just try to think ahead. Dice and, roll, yeah. <laughs> you know, just 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 do what's next best is like just keep going at it and meeting people and going above and beyond and but have an idea of obviously where you want to go. So it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's definitely been interesting, but I've been been enjoying it. So rad. So two more questions for you because I don't want to keep you all night. Um, but uh, but yeah, I my first question is, you know, for, for somebody, I guess, like you, I mean, cause let's be honest, if you, if you really had the choice at the time, what would you have wanted to do? You probably would have wanted to do motocross, you know? Yeah. That was definitely um, my dream. And so, you know, we just did a podcast with Scott law and we talked about mental health and, mm -hmm. uh, it was actually, it was really inspiring to hear from him because I mean, I mean, you, you know, probably know Scott, um, great bike racer. Yep. Um, won a lot of races and, and still had a heavy, you know, had a heavy time. And so it sounds like you went through a heavy time. So how do you feel, but it seems like you navigated it really well. What's your feedback to somebody who maybe is going through something like that? Like what, how to navigate it feedback on just reaching for something they don't even know, man, you know? Yeah. I mean, you always got to look ahead. I believe in like, you know, almost like not pigeon tail yourself into one thing, but like, you know, like almost like diversify yourself as far as like, okay, like you want to do this, but also look at what's working. Like, I mean, when I got into cycling, like I knew that door was going to shut eventually. For sure. And I know you're, and you, you gotta be smart too. Like, I know you're not going to make money cycling. Even if For you're sure. like making to the tours, like you, you're not the guy winning or top guy. Like you're not making enough to like step away. No. So, you know, always almost thinking ahead, you know, that's when I started the event stuff, you know, I started learning that, you know, just, you know, I would say just get out there, um, meet people, go to different injuries, in, different industries, like stay yeah. active. Obviously that's a huge thing. Like sitting around at home and not doing anything and just having a bad lifestyle. Like that's exactly what I was doing after I stopped racing moto. And it was just the most depressing thing ever. And cycling really pulled me out of that, thankfully. So it, it's just being like productive really. 
Um, you know, I, I read every single day. You know, I never went to college. I never went to high school. I mean, I was homeschooled, but like I read every day on stuff I want to learn. You know, it's just, it's just, there's really no excuse nowadays as far as like why you can't do something or get further. You have all these tools at your assets. It's all, you know, everything's basically online or in a book or you can go just meet people. Like it's so easy to, you know, hit someone up online or social like hey like i like what you're doing like do you mind if we like go for a ride sometime and, like i mean i even like moving sure, out that's of how this County conversation now. started exactly like it's yeah, it, yeah. there's just like there's no excuses nowadays and i mean living out here in orange county like i and even in cycling i've met some of the, my best connections and like mentors from cycling from riding from meeting people and just like hey like what do you think about this what are your two cents on this? You're not, I mean, obviously not bugging people, but just like, you know, really being, you know, being yeah. active and open yeah. and just like, you know, also like, don't be a, like a dick. Like that <laughs> is like the biggest thing. Like I used to work with yeah. like kids back when I was racing professionally and um, I was, they were like, they're actually like really good now, which is amazing. But they're like high school kids on my high school mountain bike team. And I would literally tell them, I'm like, Hey, like, dude, be nice. It's small industries it's going to get smaller. You don't know what's going to bite you if you're like mean to this guy. Cause you never know where he's going to go. Yeah. Just be respectful and just, you know, be positive. And like, I mean, that's, and I know you've talked to TJ, like I love TJ. He's like one of the, the best dudes out there. And like, you know, when, when I was at monster, I mean, I'm at monster, but like when we are looking at sign riders, you know, I know how TJ is. I know what he's doing. I was like, put him on the roster. Like this yeah. dude's rad. And he's on it and everyone loves him. That sure, part, it's a no you know? brainer. Like he's, I mean, he's such a great dude. guy. And, yeah. and it's like, it's, it's not, it's not too difficult, but like, yeah, anyone like it's in a bad state. So I mean, obviously like I still go through my emotions. Like everyone does. No one's perfect, but like, for sure, just try to be productive and, you know, try to progress with your personal life and stay active. I think that's also a big thing. Like, especially as we're getting older now, like if you don't stay active, I think that really hurts yourself mentally and physically obviously and like I feel so much better after a ride or a workout and you know not just getting so like bogged down just with work you know having sure. like a healthy lifestyle it goes for a long sure. ways but yeah I mean that's it's it's just like yeah reaching out to people or asking for advice like it's there's no excuses anymore no that's huge man and then final question is the uh, it's a funny question it's the lightest question it's the segment that I do for this podcast and it's essentially if you could have one cup of coffee and if you don't drink coffee, one beverage with one person dead or alive, who would that be? And why? And what would your beverage be? Um, well, depend, all right, let me, that's a good question. Um, and I always, and I always never send this question for a reason yeah, that's, because I want to catch you. I want to catch you like this, man. And because <laughs> for me, like coffee is easy. Like, yeah. I'd well, so the like way I look life, at it, it you let know? me, let me narrow on the person first and then I'll depend right. if it's a coffee or a beer. Okay. Um, uh, so Dead wait. or alive, anyone. Cause I feel like I it could change know. day to day. You know what I mean? Um, I have someone in my mind right now. I know, I know Mark Wahlberg would be someone. Oh, that's a good what one. he's done with his life and how, how many different industries. Um, obviously the rock, Wolf. from what he's done from you know want to be a football player to being a wrestler to now being like the highest grossing american actor yeah people want him to be the president general. isn't it crazy yeah how it's people like want his a life. wwe star to be the president yeah. so yeah. i'm drawing a i know there's someone else that i actually do really look up to but i'm drawing a blank uh even someone like elon musk like yeah I mean, that guy could have exited after PayPal and just done whatever, but like, he's just like, Oh, let's start this, this, this. And he's such a, like a visionary. Just keep going, yeah. um, even someone like Joe Rogan, like how he's pivoted from like, you know, he was a comedian to now he's, you know, obviously he's been a UFC fight announcer forever. He started his podcast, which he's like, but basically he is the largest media he now. podcast. Yes. He so he's a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Like That's insane. Honestly, I would probably just, I'd probably go with the rock just because rock, yeah. it's kind of similar. Like he was an athlete, like he failed at football, got into wrestling that did really well for him. And then he was like, I want to do, you know, act, you know, acting. And he figured that out. And yeah. now he has multiple businesses and he's crushing it. So I, mean, I don't like understand how up, that but dude like, has time it, to even have coffee with it, anyone. Exactly. Like, so yeah. I would, I'd love to have a beer with him. So we'll put yeah. it that way. 
That's but awesome. um, yeah, I would say that from like his transition, because I feel like it's somewhat, I'm not going to say parallel, but like I've kind of, you know, gone through different things as well. And like he has to, and he's figured it out. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's, let, um, let's go with that one. No, that's a good one, man. That's a good one. Well, cool. Man. What, did well, else, what, what other people say real quick? So, yeah, yeah, no. So we had, we had Justin with Kobe. We had Scott Law okay. wanted to do it with his dad. Um, okay. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and so that was an interesting one because I think uh, his his the way he put it was really really awesome. He's like, yeah, I hang out with the guy every day, but it's just like that's where I'm uplifted, you know, hanging out with my dad. Like that's where I want to be. My thing is probably I would like to hang out with Joe Rogan, man. I mean, he's oh, cracked. Yeah, be... He's cracked the media side of things. And... So under like Liney. <laughs> yeah, and and the, and the best part is is like people hate hate the guy and still listen to the guy. Like yeah, people me, like that when i see here people hate about stuff like that it's like you what, it's what is wrong nuts. with your life right now why are you so negative it is like, nuts like i just don't understand how somebody could not like like if i don't like a movie i'm just not gonna watch it whereas like yeah. you're gonna sit through a three-hour podcast and be like i don't like joe rogan like that to me is nuts but people do it yeah. um so i'd love to yeah. sit down and cool. chat with him on that and um i also like how he does his ad reads um you know people are paying him millions that guy's completely millions, real yeah and he just shoots it straight i think it's amazing i love it but yeah man well again thank you so much for your time uh guys i will put yeah, the link in the description below for spandex as well as john hornback uh so be sure to check that out uh other than that see you next time cheers guys cool, man. thank you